Chile, August 5th through October 13th, 2010. Being a miner is one of the toughest and most dangerous jobs. Working deep in the bowels of the earth comes with special dangers and difficulties. The constant noise, vibration, high temperatures, humidity, and the lack of fresh air make mining a job from hell. In some mines, work conditions are so dangerous that they are considered veritable death traps. No one knows places like these better than miners of the San Jose Copper Gold Mine near Copiapo in Chile. Located in the Atacama Desert, this mine was a disaster waiting to happen. Its owners, yearning for profit, cut expenses wherever possible and showed complete neglect in maintaining the minimum safety conditions for men working in the mine. Even before August 5, 2010, the San Jose mine was known for accidents with lethal outcomes. However, on that day, it became known to the entire world, which witnessed the drama of 33 miners trapped deep in the mine for over two months. Welcome to Dark History, where we unravel the most disastrous events in history. If you want to support the channel, consider subscribing and like this video. San Jose Mine One thing Chile is famous for is copper. The country is the world's leading producer of this highly sought after metal earning tens of billions of US dollars from its export. It is no wonder that four of the 10 largest copper mines are located in Chile. The San Jose mine was not one of the largest, but still had a reputation of its own. It was known for paying higher than average wages. Was it because the mine produced too much gold and copper? Or were the bosses simply generous fellows? None of that. It was because no one wanted to work there. San Jose Mine was a famously dangerous place to work at, and the only way to attract miners was by offering higher wages. It was a good deal for the owners of the mine, who compensated the salary costs with low investment and safety features. Between 2004 and 2010, the San Esteban Mining Company running the San Jose Mine was fined 42 times for breaching safety regulations. The number would surely be much higher if there were more than just three inspectors for the entire region. For years before the disaster, San Jose miners had been complaining about unsafe working conditions. Eight of their colleagues lost their lives in the mine only for reasons of low safety standards. Those who worked there were called the kamikazes. It was just a matter of time before the neglect of safety measures would cause a disaster that shut down the mine for good. The Disaster August 5, 2010 Luis Urzua, the mine supervisor, took his crew to a 12-hour shift. Their position was three miles away from the entrance, at a depth of 2,300 feet, 700 meters. Down there, it was a day like any other. The sound of drills echoed through the mine's corridors. Miners were digging for copper as beads of sweat covered their bodies. The moment of relief came when Urzua called for a lunch break. It didn't last long, though. First, they felt intense vibrations followed by a loud explosion that filled the mine with a cloud of dust. Miners later described feeling like the entire mountain was falling on their heads. That was precisely what happened. An enormous block of stone had broken off and fell through the layers of the mine, causing the collapse of the entire mountain above it. The mine walls were missing proper supports, giving way to disaster. Once the dust settled, the miners realized the boulder cut them off from the rest of the mine. There they were, 33 workers in pitch darkness, still in shock with what just happened. They were lucky to be alive but trapped 2300 feet below the surface with almost no food and water. The first thing that came to their mind was the ventilation shafts. If they reached them, there was a possible escape route. It was a good idea that went to waste because the shaft was missing ladders. Just another safety feature that the mine management failed to install. Two days later, another collapse occurred that completely blocked access to the shaft. The fate of the miners was now in the hand of the rescuers on the surface. Moments after the accident, a local rescue team arrived at the scene. They tried to reach the miners, but breaching through a stone block weighing 770,000 tons proved impossible. As a matter of fact, the rescuers gave little chance that anyone inside survived the collapse. The news of the accident reached the president of Chile on the same day. He set the rescue of the miners as the government's priority. The minister of mining arrived at the scene and gave command of the rescue mission to professionals from Codelco, the state-owned mining company. The government was determined to do everything in its power to save the miners, no matter the cost. 
first, rescuers needed to locate the miners. They started drilling exploratory boreholes to send listening probes to locate any sign of life. The search gave no results initially because the mine owners had provided the rescue teams with outdated and inaccurate maps. On August 7th, two days after the incident, the secondary collapse was registered. Chances of survival decreased day by day, but the rescue team was determined to can continue their search. Only on August 22nd, after more than two weeks of drilling, one borehole broke through. The operator heard someone tapping on the drill, a clear sign that someone was alive underground. When they pulled up the drill, a paper note had been attached to it. All 33 of us are fine in the shelter. For days, the trapped miners had been listening to the sound of drilling, waiting for one of the boreholes to reach them. When the tip of the drill emerged, they saw more than just a piece of steel. They saw a sign of life. Life inside the mountain. Quickly after locating the miners, a camera was lowered down the borehole to capture the image of weary but happy faces of men who, at the time, were confined for 17 days. It was called a miracle that the miners survived that long with food and drink supplies for only a couple days. Hardly would they be able to achieve this if they didn't show remarkable discipline and organization in an effort to survive. Special credit for the success went to Luis Urzua, the mine supervisor. As the shift commander, he was the mastermind of the whole survival operation. The job of a miner is quite similar to the one in the military. It is based on strict discipline and following prescribed procedures and the shift commander's orders. It was a lucky occasion that the accident happened during Urzua's shift. During the entire time miners spent confined, he showed all the qualities of a superb shift commander. When the collapse ended and the dust settled, Urzua gathered his men in the refuge shelter. He then inspected the area to get a clear picture of the situation. Once he established there was no way out, he started organizing the infrastructure to enable his men to survive as long as possible. Urzua first moved men from the shelter to tunnels where the ventilation was much better. He made a precise map of the mine and defined the areas for sleeping, working, and even a sanitary facility. Most importantly, he established a set of rules and insisted everyone obey them. Urzua was very well aware of their situation and knew the rescuers would need weeks to reach them. He rationed emergency supply of food to minimal portions. Each worker was provided with two spoons of tuna and a half a glass of milk every 48 hours. It was a meager ration but enough to keep everyone alive. Even more critical than hunger was the mental health of the workers. To keep them occupied, Urzua continued to engage workers on a 12-hour shift schedule. He even used the lights of mining trucks to simulate the sunlight and help men keep their usual daily routines. Still, life inside the mountain was very hard for miners. Each of them lost approximately 17 and a half to 20 pounds from malnourishment. Many suffered from eye and lung infections caused by the dust cloud that filled the collapsed mine. Once a connection was established with the outer world, miners' life became a bit more bearable. They were first supplied with fresh water and calorie-enriched milk. Later, they received solid food. Miners were warned, though, not to gain too much weight as they had to fit the escape tunnel the rescue team was preparing. As time passed, the number of deliveries increased. Miners received foldable beds, camping showers, video and music players, books, and games to entertain themselves. When the third borehole was drilled, enriched oxygen was pumped into the mine. The most challenging, however, was the issue of prolonged time miners spent in a confined space. The Chilean government went so far as to consult the NASA experts to help miners cope with the problem. Spending 24 hours per day in a hole thousands of feet below the surface was too much of a burden even for the miners accustomed to working in such conditions. The situation was aggravated with an assessment that rescuers would need at least four months to rescue them. Rescue. In the meantime, rescuers were making plans on how to extract trapped miners. They devised three plans, A, B, and C, each involving different drills and drilling methods. In the end, the Plan B drill team using a T-130XD air core drill was the first to reach the miners. The team started drilling on September 5th, one month after the collapse. They drilled a 28-inch wide hole at an angle of 82 degrees that connected the surface with the workshop inside the mine. The hole was created in three stages in order to ease the pressure on the drill and reduce the risk of new collapse. During the entire operation, 
Trapped miners worked in shifts to remove the debris left by the drilling operation. On October 9, 2010, the Plan B hole was finished. A specially designed capsule for extracting the miners was brought to the site. Designated Phoenix too, it was painted in colors of the Chilean national flag. The rescue operation started three days later, on October 12th, as it was how long it took the engineers to mount the capsule. The rescue operation San Lorenzo, named after the miner's patron saint, started on October 12th at 23.18 hours. The Phoenix 2 capsule descended Manuel Gonzalez, a rescue worker, to coordinate the operation from the mine. The first miner to ascend to the surface was Florencio Avalos, Urzua's deputy. He was picked as the most skillful miner in case something went wrong with the capsule. At 0011 hours on October 13th, he appeared on the surface after spending 69 days trapped in the mine. He was welcomed with the sounds of the national anthem by the president of Chile, and a crowd of miners, family members who spent weeks on the site waiting for their dearest. The rescue operation, as well as the entire event, was broadcasted worldwide. The last miner to be extracted at 2155 was Luis Urzua. Aftermath The entire accident was described as a nightmare that slowly transformed into a dream filled with hope. Still, the aftermath of the Copiapo mining accident was far from rosy for most of the miners. After being rescued, miners were granted six months of health care and the oldest miners were given lifetime pensions. For some time after the accident, Miners enjoyed the attention of the entire nation. Many of them traveled abroad to hold motivational lectures based on their dramatic experiences. However, once the media fuss ended and the attention was gone, miners started to face the consequences of the trauma they suffered. A substantial number of miners were unable to cope with it, who eventually gave way to alcohol and drug abuse. The San Jose mine owners, the most responsible for the accident, got the far better end of it. Even though they had to sell their business to make up for the rescue costs that reached 20 million US dollars, they were relieved from all charges for neglecting the safety of their employees. The copper production in Chile continued in the same manner as before the accident. I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please like and subscribe. See you next time.